this is not a number, then why does it keep showing up where numbers go? Limits, integrals, sums, products, all these things accept both numbers and infinities as parameters. We're even told that some infinities are bigger than other infinities. But does that mean infinity plus one is actually bigger than infinity? It's supposed to be the biggest number. How can something be even bigger? What would happen if you subtracted infinity from infinity? How do you even measure an infinite object in the first place? How did I get to the Wikipedia page for Girdle's Incompleteness Theorem? Where did these Hebrew letters come from? <sighs> My head hurts. Roll intro, I guess. The most natural way to describe infinity is by making a way to count objects, then using it to count something we have infinitely many of, like the natural numbers. And that's exactly what sets can give us. Sets are mathematical objects that contain other objects. This is a set, specifically one that contains nothing. It's completely empty. We can then define zero as the number of things contained in this particular set. More technically, we prefer to use the term cardinality. Similarly, we can define one as the cardinality of this set, two as the cardinality of this set, and so on. But what if we put all the natural numbers into a single set? There's nothing about the definition of a set that forbids never-ending sets like this. Notice how this gives us a nice definition for infinity. If regular numbers are the cardinalities of sets with corresponding numbers of objects, then infinity is the cardinality of a set with a never-ending quantity of objects. We know there's many different finite cardinalities, but then are there many different infinite cardinalities, or is there just one? To find out if this is the case, we need a way of telling whether two sets have the same cardinality, then figure out if it's possible to have two infinite sets with different cardinalities. Notice that if two sets have the same finite cardinality, it's possible to pair each element in the first set with its own personal and unique element in the second set. It's also possible to do this the other way around. If the sets have different cardinalities, you can't pair things up uniquely, resulting in complicated love triangles. This is antithetical to many mathematicians' desires to avoid convoluted social situations, and is this contrary to the definition of sets with equal cardinalities? Notice that there's nothing stopping us from trying this property out on infinite sets. Even though there are infinite odd and infinite even numbers, we can define a pairing between them. It's pretty straightforward to prove that everyone here is uniquely paired up. So they must have equal cardinality, meaning there's just as many even numbers as odd numbers. Makes sense. But here's where it gets weird. You can do the same thing between the even numbers and all of the integers. The conversion process is simply to multiply or divide the original number by two. Every even number is paired up with a unique integer, and every integer is paired up with a unique even number. And this is why infinity is so confusing. People will often tell you that there are as many even numbers as there are integers. We use this language because it was the clear language to use when we were talking about finite sets, even though it doesn't necessarily make intuitive sense in the infinite case. Using language like this is like saying we're illuminating a surface with a negative light source. It's like saying the average family has 2.19 children. None of these terms make consistent sense, and they're not supposed to. We continue to use the language of the simpler definition when applying it to new cases. But when we teach people about infinity and use these phrases without noting this, we create the false impression that there's supposed to be some kind of intuitive notion of size that works on infinities. The size of an infinite set is an abstract concept completely divorced from its usage as a term in English. That's why I'm going to continue to refer to this property we're talking about as cardinality instead of size, in the hopes that it helps emphasize that this concept doesn't really work the way the nomenclature of size would suggest. So far, it's looking like it might be the case that there's only one infinite cardinality. It kind of makes sense, too. If infinity is already bigger than all the other numbers, how can there be something even bigger? To confirm this, let's keep trying to make an infinite set that has a different cardinality than the set of all numbers. To start, it turns out that the rational numbers have the same cardinality as the integers. First, consider only positive rational numbers. We can order them by starting at 1 over 1, then going to 2 over 1 and 1 over 2, then going to 3 over 1, 2 over 2, and 1 over 3, followed by 4 over 1, 3 over 2, 2 over 3, and 1 over 4. Of course, we're going to end up with some duplicate numbers this way, but we can simply skip over those. This process is a way of matching up any positive rational number to a natural number. By giving a way to put every rational number in a single file order, we give each rational a corresponding natural and vice versa. We can extend this procedure to match up zero and the negative rationals by simply mapping zero to zero and the negative integers to their corresponding negative rationals. Because we can convert between rationals and integers, there are as many rationals as there are integers. 
If you haven't heard this before, you may find it surprising. Our intuition of size tells us that making all the combinations of elements in a particular set should result in a much bigger set. But since we're unconstrained by intuitive notions of size, we find that it's actually possible to pair up an infinite set of items with an infinite set of pairs of those items. If making this bigger set resulted in the same infinite cardinality, maybe no matter what we try, we'll always end up with the same infinite cardinality. So let's try one more thing. Let's try making a single file sequence of all the real numbers. Our first idea might just be to try writing out all the real numbers in order. But then, which number comes after 0? Is it maybe 0 0.1? But then we've already skipped over a bunch of other numbers. No matter how small we pick the second real to be, there's always something in between, so we'll always skip over something. So trying to write everything in order will not work. We also can't use the trick we used to sort out all the rational numbers, as that would skip over irrational numbers like pi. There's other things we could try to make a list of all real numbers, but none of them seem to work. It doesn't seem to be possible to make a list of all the real numbers, such that every real number gets its own integer numbered spot on the list. At this point, we should stop trying to prove that we can make such a thing, and start trying to prove that we cannot. An intuitive justification for going down this route is that integers only have a finite number of digits, but all real numbers have infinite numbers of digits. It's impossible to use a finite amount of information to accurately represent an infinite amount of information, so you can't give each real number its own integer. To make a more formal argument, we can construct a proof by contradiction, where we prove that the concept of a complete list of all real numbers contradicts itself. This proof is called Cantor's diagonalization argument, and its generalized version will be helpful to us later. The fact that we can't make a list of all the real numbers finally tells us that there is actually more than one infinite cardinality. So we can't just slap this symbol on these sets and call it a day. Since all the Greek and Roman letters are busy doing physics or whatever, mathematicians invoke the use of Hebrew letters. Specifically, the cardinality of the integers, which is also the cardinality of the naturals and the rationals, is denoted bet zero, while the cardinality of the reals is denoted bet one. If you've heard about this topic before, you might be wondering where Aleph went. They're on break right now, but we'll get into their story once we explore these cardinalities a bit more. I'd like to point out that not only are these cardinalities different, but bet one is in some sense bigger than bet zero. Just like before, we can make a general definition of what this means that works on both finite and infinite sets. If we have a set with 5 elements and a set with 4, notice how it's impossible to give each of the original elements its own unique element in the corresponding set. This means the first set is larger than the second. Notice how this definition is the opposite of sets having equal cardinality. A set has greater cardinality than another one if we cannot make a unique pairing between their elements. So now we've seen that not only are there many different infinite cardinalities, but some of them are actually bigger than others. This system of cardinalities is called the cardinal numbers. This name suggests we can do arithmetic to add and multiply cardinal numbers, which is exactly what we're about to do. Just like our definition of cardinality, we want our definition of arithmetic to produce the results we expect when we use them on finite numbers, while keeping them general enough to work on infinite numbers as well. For example, consider this sum. Notice that 5 is also the number of elements we get if we combine a set with 2 elements and a set with 3 elements. In this way, we can define what it means to add cardinalities by defining something to do on the sets those cardinalities describe. Using this definition, we get an operation that behaves exactly like conventional arithmetic addition for finite numbers, but we can apply it to infinite numbers as well. For example, we can find the value of bet 0 plus 1 by finding the cardinality of the natural numbers with 0 thrown in. The result afterwards is just the non-negative integers, which also has cardinality bet 0. So bet 0 plus 1 is bet 0. Similarly, we find that bet 0 plus bet 0 is still bet 0, because combining the even and odd numbers gives us the natural numbers. Finally, bet 0 plus bet 1 is like combining the rationals with the irrationals to get the real numbers, so we get bet 1. Now we can define subtraction as the operation that undoes addition. But this is a bit tricky. As we've seen, bet 0 plus 1 is bet 0, but bet 0 plus itself is also bet 0. That means bet 0 minus itself could be 1, or it could be bet 0, or it could be any number of things. But you've probably seen something like this before in the form of square roots. Remember that the square root of 4 is not just 2, but also negative 2. We simply acknowledge that the expression in question refers to multiple values, and make sure not to treat it as if it is unique. Multiplication is defined as the cardinality of a set containing all pairings of elements from the first and second sets. So 2 times 3 is 6. Interestingly, bet 0 times itself is still just bet 0. 
Similar to what we did with the rational numbers, there are as many pairs of natural numbers as there are natural numbers themselves. Bet 1 times itself is also bet 1. Every pair of real numbers can be assigned its own unique real number and vice versa, so the two sets must have equal cardinalities. You can perform this assignment by taking any pair and interleaving their digits to get a single real number. Deinterleaving lets you go the other way, assigning real numbers to pairs. Finally, raising 2 to the power of a cardinal number has an interesting interpretation on its corresponding set. If we take a set with two elements, we can recombine those elements into four different sets, while three elements can be recombined into eight different sets. Notice that, in both cases, we've ended up with a corresponding power of two. This is because when we have three elements we can choose to put in, every set represents a unique combination of three yes or no decisions. So, raising two to the power of a cardinal number gives us how many new sets we can make only using elements of the original set. Previous operations seem to leave transfinite numbers intact, resisting any attempt to make bigger ones. This operation fixes that. 2 to the power of bet 0 is now, finally, bet 1. Actually, this is the definition of the bet numbers. We can use the diagonalization argument I mentioned earlier to prove that this always results in a distinct and bigger cardinal number. Just like we can repeatedly add 1 to get bigger and bigger finite numbers, we can repeatedly raise 2 to a power to get bigger and bigger transfinite numbers. I do find it kind of funny that we need to resort to such a brute force operation to get anything bigger at all. Can you imagine if we did the same thing with natural numbers? Alright class, let's practice our numbers. 1, 2, 4, 16, 65,536. Now, a reasonable question to ask is whether or not there's a cardinal number between bet 0 and bet 1. This is where our friend Aleph comes in. Aleph 0 denotes the first cardinal number, which is also bet 0. And Aleph 1 denotes the next bigger cardinal number after that. In other words, it's a cardinal number that is greater than bet 0, while leaving no room for another cardinal between them. A reasonable guess is to say that alpha 1 is just bet 1, that the real numbers come right after the rational numbers. This conclusion is called the continuum hypothesis. While a bit headache inducing to think about, it sounds like we should be able to prove it true or false with a clever proof, right? Right? But no! This question is not just hard to answer, it's literally impossible! To fully appreciate this, we're going to do a little history lesson. Back in the early 1900s, math was going through a bit of a crisis. At the time, different areas of mathematics were all based on different assumptions, because they all talked about different kinds of objects. Many proofs relied on intuition for some steps, rather than formal arguments. Some mathematicians began trying to build a unified system of starting assumptions, called axioms, which could be used to rigorously describe all other fields, but these attempts failed for one reason or another. Usually the axioms allowed you to prove a statement that would be considered obviously false with the existing systems of mathematics, rendering the new system useless. After 10 years, mathematician Gottlob Frege was just wrapping up the second of two volumes on a system of mathematics he defined using axioms he felt were intuitive and obvious. As this book was just about to become available to the public, another mathematician informed him that one of his axioms could, in fact, be used to construct a famous paradox published just two years earlier. This implied that truth and falsehood, as defined in the system, were actually the same thing. Technically, there were no contradictions in the system, because it's always valid to say that a statement is true or false. It's just that, due to this paradox, everything is true and false at the same time, so the concepts lose their meaning. Into this unfortunate situation entered mathematician David Hilbert and his program. Hilbert's program was his personal vision for what a unified system of mathematics should include. Among others, it included goals such as, we should prove that the system we come up with can be trusted because it has no contradictions. We should prove that anything that is true can be proven with the system. It should come with an automated way to check the truth of simple mathematical statements. And these would all be very nice things to have. It would clear up all the problems they had at the time. But unfortunately, a number of seminal proofs completely obliterated any hope of accomplishing Hilbert's program. Tarski showed that you can't make a formula for telling the truth or falsity of a statement. If you could, there's nothing stopping you from using that formula in a new statement, specifically, which the original formula, by definition, cannot accurately answer. And then this guy named Girdle comes along and says that if your system can do even basic arithmetic, it can't prove everything. And to top that all off, he proved that one of those unprovable statements is whether or not the system is trustworthy. You'd have to come up with a more powerful system to answer that question. But then, you don't know if the more powerful system might have its own contradiction. 
Once everyone got over that load of disappointment, they eventually settled on a good enough system of mathematics called ZFC. It might contain a lurking contradiction, but so far no one's found one, so it's probably fine. Maybe this is okay. Maybe we just accept that everything in math comes with a little 99.99% likely to be true. That's better than most everything else. Even though we can't prove there's no contradictions, we can basically prove everything else of consequence, right? Right? To be specific, the ZFC system isn't strong enough to prove or disprove the continuum hypothesis. If you try to make a stronger system, you could always design it so that the continuum hypothesis is true, or you could design it to make it false. Mathematicians have shown a few statements to be equivalent to the truth or falsity of the continuum hypothesis. So basically, how true these are depends on how you're feeling on any given day. Luckily though, these results are relatively inconsequential, and we haven't found any practical use for them. Yet. Which is why no one's bothered to rally an effort to officially extend ZFC to accept or reject the continuum hypothesis. What's much, much worse is this C. See, it used to just be ZF, but then mathematicians realized it would be really handy to have this thing called the axiom of choice so that they can prove a few niche advanced purely hypothetical statements like if two sets aren't the same size, then one of them is bigger. Luckily though, math seems to favor it being true much more than it favors it being false. Math is just more cumbersome to do without it. Well, that's the end of that tangent. Let's get back on track and finish learning about how infinity works. The one thing left to wrap up is what infinity means in these kinds of equations. Informally, they mean you should do the operation forever until you get a single answer. But this definition doesn't really work. The definition of the sum, for example, requires adding together a bunch of numbers until you get an answer. But if you try to add an infinite quantity of numbers together, you'll just keep going on forever and ever, never actually arriving at an answer. What we need is an extended definition of these operations that will let us make sense of infinity in this context. The way we do this is with a calculus tool called the limit, which lets us reason about infinity by only using finite numbers. When a function has a particular limit at a particular input, it says that the closer you get to that input, the closer the function gets to that limit. It doesn't matter if the function isn't even defined at that exact point. The limit will just tell you what probably exists there, given the value that's approached as we get close to it. Notice how we can use this tool to analyze points on functions that we can get closer to, but not actually arrive at. For example, x divided by x is 1 everywhere, except at 0, where 0 divided by 0 is undefined. But if we take the limit when x equals 0, we very conveniently get a value of 1. We don't have to come up with a new definition of division to make sense of x divided by x. We can just slap this limit on it and call it a day. Now, let's look at those infinite operations again. It would be a pain to make new definitions for each of these operations that say how they handle infinities. Instead, we can just use the existing definitions and slap the limit on top of them. Like before, the limit tells us what we get closer to as we get closer to infinity. We'll often skip this formality and just say that the limit tells us what happens at infinity, even though your typical operation doesn't have a sensible definition for what happens when you plug in an actual infinite number. So this equation is really telling us that as we get closer to infinity, the sum gets closer to 2. In summary, it's really hard to directly make a definition for plugging infinity into these operations. So instead, we use the limit to check if we consistently approach some specific output as the input approaches infinity. Using this tool, we can plug infinity into all kinds of different operations, without having to make definitions for what it means on a case-by-case -case basis. And there we have it. If we put aside our usual intuitions of size, we can formulate a consistent definition of the size of infinite sets that lets us do all kinds of crazy things. We covered how the cardinalities of different sets forms a basis for a system of numbers that includes infinite ones. We also saw that there are many different kinds of infinity, and that you can do arithmetic on them. We then took a quick detour to explore the historical implications of the questions surrounding infinity. And finally, we saw how the limit can be used to extend operations on finite numbers to work with infinity as well. I hope this video helped you understand infinity a little bit more. See you in the next one.